the Ron Paul Revolution, a manifesto of human freedom and the dignity of man. Everywhere the clamoring is getting louder and louder. Freedom is dead, long live freedom. Our politicians are telling us that we must give up our freedom for security. The fascists are saying that freedom makes us weak. It poisons the national character and makes us vulnerable to terrorist attacks. The socialists are saying that freedom makes us selfish. Our wealth and our private property must be forcefully extracted from us and redistributed by the divine wisdom of the party bureaucrats through taxes or worse, who know better than we do the true needs of our society. The economists say that freedom is dangerous, that we need a central bank with foreign stock and private shareholders to regulate our currency and scientifically prevent or manufacture stock market crashes. Unless, of course, by freedom you mean free trade or free markets, in which case corporate welfare, no-bid military contracts and subsidies, monopolistic mergers and inside trading are very much to be desired, or so they think. They forget the poverty of indigenous peoples and the lesson of the Great Depression, which was a managed withdrawal of currency on the part of the Fed. The environmentalists warn us that too much freedom leads to overconsumption, the ruination of our natural resources. They forget that big government poses a bigger threat to our continued survival than climate change. For we have survived periods of global warming and cooling before, but in times of universal slavery, our survival rate diminishes exponentially. Our scientists are telling us that we are mere passive vessels for the self-replicating units of biology and culture respectively called genes and memes. Our behavior can be reduced to simple evolutionary e expedience and algorithms. They tell us with their readiness potential studies that the brain lights up before we do, or in other words, there seems to be brain activity before we act, before we even intend to act, and therefore our intentions are not the true causal agents. Rather, it is the completely automatic processes of the neuronal substrate of the brain itself. They forget Hume's analysis of causation and forget that neither succession nor correlation in time proves that one event causes another. Our philosophers are telling us that we have a plurality of selves, or rather no self at all. Just an epiphenomenon, a shadow on the cave wall, a limiting ego construct that obscures the fundamental emptiness of true reality, or the free play of the liberated esthete always testing the liminal edges. They forget the phenomenology of daily life and apparently lack the deliberation we all experience when we are called upon to act on our choices and remember the accumulation of consequences thereafter. Our psychologists are telling us that our actions as causal agents are severely limited by our chemical imbalances, our brain diseases, our complexes and neuroses, our unconscious, our family history, our operant conditioning. Accordingly, the answer is not punishment reform by deliberation, but rather positive and negative reinforcement through the proper environmental and medical stimuli. And this is the crux of the matter. If we are indeed free causal agents, if we deserve to be punished for any civic wrongdoing, we deserve to be punished for any civic, civic wrongdoing. Yes, please punish me. I deliberately and consciously transgress the laws of this nation and or the social contract, either because I flatly disagreed with these laws or I thought in my cleverness I could very well get away with it. But now, locked away as I am, the sting of conscience is far too great, and I repent. If I am merely the product of my operant conditioning, on the other hand, punishment and or incarceration would only prove to be a deterrent, reflecting the pinball in the machine this way rather than that. There is no moral retribution to be had, and furthermore, society has a vested interest in actively taking steps to condition me and others like me to behave properly. Left to my own devices, I cannot be trusted, ill-equipped as I am in my ignorant state of nature. It is, the, it is the platonic belief refashioned anew that human beings only commit crimes or evil due to lack of knowledge, or rather, the right conditioning. Thus. Two fundamentally different conceptions of the nature of human beings is revealed and are currently vying for each, with each other for power in the legislative and public sphere. On the one hand, there is the Enlightenment belief reflected in the writings of the framers of the Constitution and the dignity of man, or woman, but I'm just going to say man here. 
If you believe in the dignity of man, certain aspects of the Constitution become almost corollary. The right to bear arms, for example, assumes that the gun owner is a rational creature who can better defend his property and his life than, the, than federal and state law enforcement because he has a greater stock in each. Indeed, the language goes further in implying that if these authorities transgress their legal bounds and violate the social contract, in which authority was granted to them specifically and only in order to protect the rights of each citizen, as Locke and Mill spelled out in their, ver their various treatises on liberty, remember there's no divine right of kings here, he in turn has the right as a rational and sovereign citizen in an act of conscious deliberation to correct them with lethal force if necessary. Here it is assumed that the nature of power is such that tyranny must always be guarded against by a well-armed populace. And the benefit of the doubt always goes to the citizen who has more to lose in any compromising situation than the state. This is also reflected in the adversarial nature of our justice system in which the burden of proof rests with the state in proving the guilt of the defendant, whose innocence is assumed by default because, on the whole, his dignity is upheld from the beginning. We see this in the protections of free speech, i.e., or a democratic republic depends on rational debate and informed consent in an open marketplace of ideas for its continued lawful existence, or else it soon loses its legitimacy to popular sentiment and hysteria. We see this in the non-establishment of religion or a state church. No one, neither the state nor an elite, has a monopoly on the truth or the path to salvation, and each citizen shall examine the various creeds privately with a view to their own betterment. We see this in the advocation of private property. The individual family com and or community knows better what to do with their land than the state because they cultivate it and live on it and are acquainted with its climate and its produce. We see this in the contempt for excessive, unapportioned, direct taxation. The individual family community knows better what to do with their labor and the fruits thereof because they earn it by the sweat of their brow than the state which passively reaps its income or perhaps even actively reaps it in times of war, etc.